Yeah. Anyway, that's that's yeah. the story what happened. I guess you worked with Dave for a while, right? How long did you work with Dave solo? Well, I worked with him. I worked with Dave probably up till about 2006, 2007 when he got back in Van Halen. Wow, that's amazing. So, And did you work with the reunited Van Halen with Wolfie or no? No, no. not at all. Okay. Not one bit. I saw some really wild shots, which I don't think anybody ever saw, which was you did shoots with Eddie Van Halen at his house in 1996 when the band was between Sam and Dave and Gary and that whole thing. How did that come about? Well, it could have been for Guitar World or Guitar okay. Player, or one of the guitar magazines. If you go on my website, Zlow, Z-L-O-Z dot com, there's over 800 magazine covers right. from all around sure, the world. Sure, sure. Not this little postage stamp inside and not this half page, actual magazine cover. So I, I, you know, still do work for a lot of magazines and I don't shoot that much anymore just because being a photographer is the most worthless, pathetic, underrated, unappreciated profession on the face of the planet. Really? Well, if you ask me, I mean, you know, all these (laughs) people with, you know, digital cameras now, they aren't even foolproof. They're idiot proof. Wow. Any idiot, they may not even be able to spell or read or write, but they can shoot a good photo. So, wow. And I don't want to be lumped into that category, so I don't really shoot anymore. And I'm old, and I've done it. I, I've moved on to other things in my life that I enjoy, like working on motorcycles and mm-hmm. working on cars and restoring old vintage cars. Oh, and wow. Things like that. So, yeah, I still license photos you know my whole guns and roses and van halen and Led right. Zeppelin, and that's fine i don't need to shoot anymore because it's just a worthless throwaway profession no one appreciates photography anymore. it's incredible so now you worked heavily with motley crew as well and i was wondering how would you compare the crew with van halen in terms of like who was wilder well honestly Let's just say I did things, I saw things, and I participated in things with Van Halen that I never did with any other band. You know, Motley Crue were supposed to be the bad boys. You know, Van Halen aren't necessarily the bad boys. They're more the fun party boys. I probably had a lot more fun with Van Halen, and like I said, did things, saw things, participated in right. things. And I'm only going to leave it to the listener's, you know, imagination of what went down. Of course, but of course. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, most people can't even conceive of things that we did happening in their life. But I had fun with Motley Crue. I mean, back then, Nikki was one of my my best friends in the whole world and me, Nikki Six and Robin Crosby, you know, we had that infamous trip to Martinique where we caught, you know, tons of human debauchery and stuff like that. <laughs> but other than, other than that, but Van Halen was really just a one of a kind band. These two books that you put out, which are really just stellar, some of the greatest documentary items that Van Halen has, they came from you. So these two coffee table books, one just on Ed and one on Van Halen is really Really something that is coveted amongst the Van Halen community and so many people are excited about it. you have some pics in here that are so personal like when you have Ed and Al on dirt bikes and you've captured the relationship of Ed and Al when you see stuff that the crowd can't see was when Ed is faced Al and they're sort of musically communicating on stage and you're on the stage taking the shot from Alex's point of view and you can get Eddie's reaction and stuff like that so how would you describe that brother connection are you talking about the outdoor shot? Yeah. The close up of Ed? Yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorite shots to add. You can't even see Al, but you could tell I was back there yep. with Al. That's right. He's looking and he's got this real honest grin on his face. His brother, like, yeah, that was 1979, I think. Right. And they, like I said, they were still sort of wet under their ears, and that was an outdoor stadium show, and I, I love that photo myself. You know, they were a very tight-knit clan, you know, they're from the Netherlands, and, you know, they're a little different type of family when you grow up in Europe or whatever than American families and so on, but they, they're very tight, the two brothers. You've also captured Eddie airborne more than anybody. I mean, you've had him jumping, leaping onto the speakers and in the air and splits and stuff. Is that a- a tough thing to do i mean i don't know how you did it with your photography you caught him and a lot of them are even not blurry they have a frozen shot of him in the air so was that always a challenge to get eddie airborne well i mean back then eddie was younger so i used to do it a lot and i don't know if he supposedly he was going to have some hip operation so yeah. obviously in his later years he didn't jump as much right but, you know being a photographer look you know you have 
two motions. You got the up motion, you got the down motion, but you have that motion right at the very top, which is a transition between going up and going down. And me being such a music freakazoid, I just knew when to shoot it. I mean, I saw enough Van Halen shows. And, you know, back then it was film. And you had to pay for the film and pay for the processing. It right. wasn't just put a digital chip in and you could shoot thousands of photos right. for free <laughs> and just cross your fingers and hope you get the right shot at the right time. So back then, you know, being a photographer meant something. You had to know your trade. You had to know your medium. In other words, the camera and the film and what your capabilities were. You know, that was just something, whatever I do, whether I'm restoring a motorcycle or cooking dinner or boning some chick or whatever, I try to do it 150%. Maybe that's why Van Halen used me so much and liked my photos, because I gave him something no one else could capture. I, I don't know. Right. It's just something that's always been part of me, try to give it 150%. You also shot the cover of Noel's book, which is a photo of Van Halen backstage in Midland, Texas, in what you described as a rough night. What was that all about? Well, there were a lot of pranks, but let's just say me and Michael Anthony and Dave's friend, Stan, who was his childhood friend, we were all at the hotel. It was a Sunday we were aboard, and all of a sudden we saw these things flying around, and we're like, what the hell are those things? You know, we didn't know what they were. And so all of a sudden we got up, and there were a lot of them, and there were these big, ugly bugs, and they basically were flying around like they had no eyes, and they would smash himself into the plate glass windows of the hotel room doors and drop basically dead. <laughs> so Al and Dave just came back from some promo tour of Africa or South Africa, and they had these monkey paws, which everybody said, don't bring them back because it's like voodoo and you're going to be cursed if you bring them back. Right. So, so Michael came up with this idea and said, oh, you know what, Al, it could have been Stan, but Michael or Stan said, oh, you know what, Al really has this phobia and stuff like that. So what we decided to do was grab about three or four of these bugs and we put them in a cup. And then every couple of weeks, the hairdresser who did Dave's hair would come out to do Dave's hair and cut everybody else's hair. So while right. Al was getting his hair cut, Michael got these bugs and he went down to the front desk and he asked for the hotel room key to Al's room. And he put these four huge bugs that look like big bumblebees, but they were uglier. And he laid them across his pillow. Oh, so, geez. so then he got out of the room. And then we're all hanging in my room or something like that. And Al was getting his hair cut. And then Al goes back to his room. And all of a sudden, he sees these bugs and has a meltdown. And he calls up the <laughs> tour manager, who was Steve Vando at the time, and goes, Vando, come here quick. So Vando goes in the room, sees these bugs. Vando's like, okay, Vando's, well, you know, Alex thought he had the curse or something from Al. Africa. So Vando goes down. Yeah, Vando goes down to the hotel front desk and goes, "Hey, did anybody ask for a key to this room, which was Al's room?" And then the girl replies, "Oh yeah, this little short balding guy came down and asked for the key." Which Vando figured out was Michael Anthony. Of course. And so then he tells Al, "Well, that night at the gig, so we're all backstage, and Al isn't one to have pranks pulled on him. So, Al, backstage, if you look at everybody's face in that photo, everybody's uptight knowing Al's going to do something. So that night, <laughs> Al brought the bugs to the gig. Oh, God. And Al, knowing that Michael swigs Jack Daniels, Al decided he was going to put the four bugs in the cup of Jack Daniels that Michael had on stage. Oh. And Michael was going to all of a sudden take a swig and eat these bugs. Oh, and like see God. Him. But instead, somehow, Ed ended up with the glass of Jack Daniels oh. with the bugs. And it, it was just a whole big traumatic night. We <laughs> knew Al still wanted to get even back at the hotel room. <laughs> Al used to take super glue and go down the hallway and put super glue into the your hotel room locks and once uh. it dried you couldn't get in your hotel room or you'd be walking to your hotel room and al would grab your hotel room key out of your hand and he'd run to your door put the key in then the part that was sticking off he'd hit with his palm and he'd break the key off in your door <laughs> so you couldn't get in you'd have to call a locksmith to get into your hotel room oh it, my it was a God. rough night al was the jokester of the band <laughs> al liked to play a lot of practical jokes and it's funny because me and al used to hang out the most on tour dave was busy usually trying to pick up all the girls he could pick up by 1980 <laughs> eddie was with valerie so that cut out everything at that point right. michael was married 
married. So me and Al, we were the bachelors. We used to hang together. We used to get in a lot of trouble. Wow. That's wild. So now you also describe Michael Anthony as one of the nicest people in rock. I can't say anything bad about Michael. I mean, it's funny because these Austrian filmmakers did a documentary about me, and out of all the people in Van Halen, I got Michael to be in my documentary. I mean, oh, we got Steve Vai, Satriani, Zach Wilde, Nuno Betancourt, John Five, Henry Rollins, Paul Stanley, Stephen Piercy, Frankie Bell. We got all these people, but I wanted Michael because Michael's got a great personality. Michael's got a lot of great slow stories, but yeah, Michael's one of my favorite people I ever worked with in my whole entire life. So why do you think that Eddie has such a issue with Michael and tossed him out? You know what? I don't really know, to yeah. be honest with you. I mean, the Ed that I knew back in 1978 to 1984, that guy doesn't exist anymore. But it's the same with Dave. I learned from my mentor, Buddha, because I practice Buddha teaching. Everything changes. Nothing stays the same. And I'm not the same guy I was in 78, 79, 1982. So people change. It's funny because I found out I've worked with a lot of bands, whether it was Poison or Rat or Van Halen. And in the beginning, when they have no money, they're all the best of friends and they're all sleeping in one bedroom apartments and they're all eating McDonald's hamburgers and they're all sharing and boning the same chicks and they're all the best of friends. They're like a real family. And then as, as soon as fans start making money, you know, and this guy's driving his Lexus, well, this guy's got to outdo him, so he's got to get it the BMW and then this guy's got to outdo him, so he gets the Mercedes. And then this guy's girlfriend's got a size 34 chest, so this guy's got to buy his chick a 36, 38 rack, and then the next guy's got to buy his chick a 42 rack to be better than this. And there's so much animosity wow. and so much jealousy. And, for instance, one guy writes all the music and writes the lyrics, but he's splitting the publishing with the other three guys who he doesn't feel contributes as much to the project. I mean, there's just so many reasons. I mean, when you deal with human beings, there's a thousand variables that could happen in any given situation. And you have to really look at things from a lot of different angles. So, of course. You know, course. I don't really know what happened with Michael. I love Michael. He was always the nicest, sweetest guy, you know, you could possibly imagine. Absolutely. Now, you also shot Ed with his whole guitar arsenal. And that's a, a famous picture with him in the pink jumpsuit and stuff. And and, and yeah, yeah, that was in 1980. He brought his stuff to my studio, and we did that. So now you had uh, an infamous cover of Spin Magazine where you had David Lee Roth with this, I guess, sexy Texas chick. Do you remember that one where he was in sort of the bikini bottoms and the robe? Girl like it was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that, is, is that something that you walked into? Is that something that you staged? Like, how does that come about? Well, I remember flying in, and I think once again, it was Midland. No, that was Corpus Christi, Texas, 1979. And I just flew in, and I remember going into the dressing room, and there was this little cute skinny blonde chick there. And I don't know if she was a clothing designer or what, but she had a sewing machine and she was all like, you know, talking to Dave and she, and she was really cute, I remember. And so she was back there and, you know, Dave was in his underwear or whatever the hell he's wearing back there. And basically we did some shots. It was Dave's idea. He put the strawberry in his mouth or whatever. <laughs> and we did those, did those photos. You know? There was like a Hugh Hefner shot. It was probably better than a Hugh Hefner <laughs> shot because Dave looks great. Of course, you know, Hugh of course. Hugh didn't quite look as good as Dave, at least not in 1979. But yeah, it was a classic. Absolutely. I got a big poster of that hanging up in my studio. I think Spin made some type of promotional poster and gave me one. Now, for your book about Ed, you had all kinds of comments from guitarists from every angle, from Billy Gibbons to Joe Satriani to Steve Vai to Zach Wilde, Ronnie Montrose, Gary Moore, C.C. DeVille, Joe Bonamassa. Do they all revere Ed? What, what makes him stand out and be so beloved? Well, like I said, Ed was an innovator. No one played guitar like Ed did back in 1978. At least, you know, that's when I first hooked up with him. But, you know, he was an innovator. And all those people, you know, whether it's Steve Vai or Joe Satriani, they didn't come around, you know, they may have been playing guitar back then, but they didn't really get their notoriety. I mean, I started working with Joe 
show in 78, 79, and Vi in 86. So, you know, Eddie was around in 78. Like I said, no one played guitar like that. Who? What guitarist? You had Jimi Hendrix, who basically changed the face of guitar play. And, you know, after that, you did have Randy Rhodes, but, you know, I love Randy. He was a, you know... A 